There are two types of talks in the BBA seminar series. One type includes researchers discussing the details of brain systems that they study. Um, those are the things that I think about as got injured in us with a brain injury. The other type includes clinicians focused on specific therapies that help people work to restore function in brain systems that they got injured. Pushing boundaries is a great example of that second type. Pushing Boundaries is a Washington-based nonprofit organization that provides exercise therapy for those navigating neurological movement disorders and paralysis. I approached them from a TBI-centric perspective and had no idea about how much they help um, other types of neurological conditions and those with spinal cord injury. The effort and time necessary to do this kind of work, this kind of therapy and this kind of repetition um, is very difficult and I think that there are many factors to sort out in addition to getting to the actual therapy and doing the therapy. This presentation does a great job getting into many of those factors. So for those of you just coming on, my name is Michael Latour and I am with an organization called Pushing Boundaries. We are a nonprofit based in Redmond, Washington, so right outside of Seattle, uh, and we provide exercise therapy. And uh, Dan invited us here today. I am with Kristen Knight, who is my programs manager. Um, she is also one of our exercise therapists. She she heads up that team. Um, so we're here today to talk to you mostly about exercise therapy with traumatic brain injury in the course of that we're going to talk a little bit about us um, but also at the end we're going to talk a little bit about other resources around the country that are kind of similar because i know not everybody is is obviously local to the pacific northwest um, and uh, i'll start our we have a presentation we've got some videos and i'll start it all up in a sec i just want to say when i start the presentation i can't see you all nancy um is is a, a rock star i know from last last uh, uh presentation i think you were on on the chat quite well um and so uh if there are questions feel free to interrupt us we also have some space built in at various times um uh for people to ask questions but were totally interruptible, um, and uh, yeah, uh, Kristen, you want to say a little May bit? May I about just add that? one thing and uh, do mute yourself while the presenter is talking, and you have an option of not just interrupting but putting your question in the chat box. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, Kristen, do you want to just say a, a say a little hello? Hi, I'm Kristen. Um, thank you for having us. We're, we're excited to be here today, and I uh, hope you learned something. All right, everybody, are you seeing a presentation? Yes. Brilliant, thank you. All right. And thanks so, for sharing what you said earlier, Michael. That's important, like the switching, the tech side makes it all weird. Oh, I'll it, mute myself. It, it, it really yeah. does. It really does. And I feel a little uh, 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 out of depth because I can't see any of your faces. Uh, so uh, it, there's something about when it's uh, when it's a uh, PowerPoint. So um, again, just to reiterate, I'm, I'm the associate director here at Pushing Boundaries, and Kristen is our programs manager. Um, uh, we're going to go through today and give you a little bit about us, um, just to give you some context, and a little bit about exercise therapy. Um, we, I want, I feel like it's important to state we are not experts in brain injury neurology. We are experts in exercise therapy, and our team works with a variety of, of neurological diagnoses um, and integrates exercise therapy into each individual's recovery. So we know that um, we're sitting on a call with a, a bunch of experts in, in, in brain injury and that each of those injuries are unique and different. Um, and that's kind of Part of what makes us, I think, unique and different is that we really partner with our with our clients um, uh, and bring our expertise to the table, uh, and allow our clients to bring their expertise in their own diagnoses to the table. Um, we have a client profile for you today. So one of our clients, Chris, who Kristen and I happen to adore, um, was kind enough to do a little interview. So um, we'll have a video with him talking about uh, his experience with the TBI and how exercise helps. And then we're going to talk a little bit about exercise specific to TBI. Um, and
and also provide some resources for uh, activity-based therapy. That's kind of what this is generally called out there in the world, is activity-based therapy. And again, feel free to chime in with questions, uh, and we also have some built-in time as the, day, as the uh, presentation progresses. Um, so we have been around for 17 years. We've had 1,100, I think it's like 1,180 now clients. Um, and this year, uh, we were hoping to, to crest 75,000 hours. I think we're going to be end up being right around 74,000 um, hours of exercise therapy. One of us, before the end of today, will put our website in the chat. We have a free online resource center um, on our website, um, and it has a variety of resources. A lot of them are local to um, the Seattle metropolitan area, but some of them are national as well. Um, and so we'll put that in the chat because anyone's welcome to go to our resource center. I think it's important, the, the picture there is a couple named Alan and Sharon, and they were in a motor vehicle collision in 2000. Um, Alan uh, had a spinal cord injury and was looking for something like pushing boundaries when he was released from the hospital. Um, they ended up relocating to Southern California to find something like it um, and then missed Seattle and moved back here and opened Pushing Boundaries in 2005. Um, uh, when they opened the facility, the focus was really spinal cord injury specific. And within a year, year and a half, they realized the um, the uh, uh, breadth and depth of, of neurological impact that was out there and how exercise could help. So. Um, so they expanded their focus beyond spinal cord injury. Um, and I say that because um, I think the fact that we were founded by a client, and I'm going to say we, we refer to our clients as clients, not patients, that we were founded by a client really informs everything we do. We really start from the client perspective with everything that we do. Um, so... Uh, uh, our clients range in age. We are, I think our youngest has been two years old. Our oldest right now has, I think, I think this is wrong. And now that I'm thinking about it, KK, you can probably tell me, but I think we've had gone up to like 88, 89. Our current oldest client is 82. Some of our clients are working to regain lost function and others are working to keep the function that they have. You know, um, our most common diagnoses and conditions we work with are spinal cord injury, stroke, traumatic brain injury. We also have a lot of clients with MS and cerebral palsy. Um, and so some of our clients are really have an event that, in, that initiated their condition or diagnosis, like a traumatic brain injury, and some have a diagnosis or even a congenital condition. Um, so um, that is kind of the really broad spectrum. Kristen, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk some exercise therapy stuff. All right, thank you. Um, so exercise therapy, um, we can kind of break down into these components. Um, as Michael mentioned, we are very much client driven. We want the clients to tell us what their goals are um, and we will help them break those down into smaller goals if need be to help them achieve it um, or just um, sort of create a more realistic timeline to get them to where uh, they want to be. Um, Neurological re-education is a huge part of exercise therapy, um, and that uh, comes down to a lot of repetition of movement. Um, gait training, we do a lot of gait training here um, with robotics, with parallel bars, harnessing, um, all different kinds of uh, ways to work on gait training here. Um, and then just general strength building. Um, we know muscles can be affected in different ways um, with atrophy, with um, complete paralysis or ataxia, different tone and spasm patterns, things like that. Um, and strength building can help um, ease some of that and um, just help with movements in general. Um, and then the goals of exercise therapy um, from our end, um, as I just mentioned, enhance that musculoskeletal function, uh, remediate and or prevent further impairment and uh, to some more support autonomic functions. Um, being uh, upright and Moving um, helps so much more than just building muscle. Um, it can help any other things that are affected blood flow. Um, if, if 
people are dealing with different kinds of paralysis, blood flow, skin conditions, um, digestive issues can be um, a problem. And even if paralysis, paralysis is not um, part of your condition, some of those pathways can be affected um, and exercise can help rebuild some of those pathways or find other ways around them. Um, and then all of these uh, just optimize overall health, um, health and uh, hopefully help you um, lead a more comfortable uh, and independent life. So we have a few uh, pieces of specialized equipment that help us with uh, all those components. So this first one here um, is pretty new to us. Um, it's called the Indigo and uh, we also refer to it as robot pants. Um, it is an overground uh, robotic modular system that we sort of build around the client. Um, so it's really customized to the person using it. Um, and there's two different ways that we can use it. So there's two programs. One is for complete paralysis um, below the level of injury. So if they need full help standing and walking, uh, the robot can provide that support and provide that movement. Um, but there's also a program for people who just need a little bit of um, help with gait. If there's some foot drop, if there's, um, you know, the, the knee drive needs some work or the hamstrings need a little help kicking through, um, the, the robot can help smooth out some of those patterns. And it's really amazing to watch um, somebody walk before and after even just one session uh, with, the, with the system. Kristen, cool. is the um, thing that the patient is wearing the robotic device? Yep, it is. Oh. When you set all those muscles and all those parts, it's always the neurological that's being worked on as opposed to the muscle, or is it both? It's both. Um, so part of the um, difference about using a robotic system versus um, a therapist just helping move the legs in different ways yeah. uh, is that repetition that I was talking about earlier. So right. repetition is really what helps make those pathways again if they've been lost or if they've been interrupted um and then for those who uh are maybe not going to get function back who have total paralysis uh it helps with those autonomic functions that i was talking about so being upright the human body is meant to be upright um so it helps with that blood flow it helps with that bone density it helps with the musculature staying intact um keeping the muscle stretched out not getting contractures um all of that um, so there's, there's different ways it can help different people. Um, if the musculature is still intact and still working, um, that repetition helps keep it that way and strengthening it. Um, if it's not there or it's um, affected a little bit, then that repetition will help make those pathways again. Right. And in that sense, um, do you have like autonomic specific exercises or does it tend to need to go through the same um, effort and exercise yeah, some, yeah, some people only use it to be upright and get those autonomic changes. They're, they might never regain the ability to walk, and that's not the, the point. The method is still the same, that repetition of walking and being upright and putting the body through the movements of what um, of how the human body is sort of supposed to move. Um, right. And they're not doing it to regain the function of walking or necessarily re-strengthen certain areas. They're, they're doing it to get blood flow to those areas to keep those muscles from um, being in a contracture or, or um, being tightened up. They're doing it to help alleviate um, tone, spasms, ataxia, things like that. Kristen, can I ask you something? Sure. Um, I'm not sure if this is gonna come out right. What I'm wondering about is, you know, you talk about the physical aspects of the exercise. And what I'm wondering about if somebody is, um, depending on the injury, of course, I'm wondering about the cognitive impairments. What is the relationship between somebody who's going through this kind of, I'll just call it physical therapy, exercise therapy, and their ability to understand instructions or to communicate or, you know, whatever yeah, the cognitive... Sure. Makes total sense. Um, and yeah, actually- how, how does that fit together? I'm not sure how, how to pose the question. Good question, Randy. Yeah. Yeah, there, there does need to be a level of, um, a person needs to be able to follow instructions. We haven't with our clientele run into anybody that we wouldn't use this with on, on account of not being able to follow um, instructions. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, it's, it's made to be pretty straightforward and not the same things um, like it's always going to start stepping with the same foot. It's always going to stand up the same way. We're always going to put it on the same way. Um, so as long as those kind of like cognitive, as long as we can really talk the person through it, um, really the the bigger issue that we can run into is um, 
if somebody has lost the ability to talk or has some kind of aphasia um, and being able to let us know if, if they're in pain. That that right. would be like a big indicator of like, maybe we shouldn't use this if somebody can't uh, right. get across that they're like in pain or something's going wrong. Um, but, that would be a bigger factor. Does all of this sort of imply that cognitive rehab may need to be done first before physical exercise as opposed, or is it a simultaneous approach? It can be simultaneous. Um, we we don't uh, we don't work on cognition here. Um, right. It can be sort of a part of of exercise, just by nature. I, and I do have another technical question, Kristen. Before you move on, I hope you could just briefly answer. Sure. Um, in the video, it was looking to the comment here that it, the person was locking her knees with each step. So mm -hmm. their weight's not balanced over her toes. Is that normal for the device? Yes. Yeah, so in this case, um, this was this um, client's first time using the device. And um, currently she has no function before below her level of injury. Um, so she needs full support. Um, and full support when you have no function is a straight knee. Um, it's uh, just the mechanics of the way the um, the robot works being in that straight knee position. Um, we do make sure the knee's not hyperextending. It's part of the setup and the fit on, on the robot. Um, and part of what you're seeing with her locking the knee out and the, the weight shifting, um, she can weight shift a little bit on her own. So sometimes not being on the toes is just her not being quite used to the, the machine yet too. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I think it's important to, to also note. So normally our clients don't have this um, big of an audience. Um, <laughs> this, this footage is from, um, as Kristen indicated, this is a brand new piece of equipment that we lovingly got from some federal funds. Um, and so this footage is from the team's uh, training week. So this client was a volunteer who came in to allow the team to be trained on it back in August. So there's a, there's a lot of newness in this video. It just was a video that we had that showed the equipment in a really clear way that, um, that we thought was, was good. Was she able to walk without the assistance of the robot at all? No. But a lot of the equipment we use, there's, there's a, a learning curve to just being on the equipment too. Um, and that is part of the learning process. The robot is not doing all the work for her. Yes, it's it's holding her musculature in place, but there's a lot of work that she's doing with her core, with her arms, she's weight shifting. Um, so it's all still, uh, it's not a passive <laughs> therapy. Can, can you talk about that learning curve at all? Or is that later in the presentation? Or? Um, I can talk about it with each. So this this one in particular probably has the the biggest learning curve. Um, I guess it's more the the body can adapt to different equipment that we use, and I'll I'll talk about that with each piece of equipment that we go over. Okay, cool. All right, so this is our bioness. Um, not turn the volume now. <laughs> um, so this this piece of equipment is um, it's a cuff that goes around your calf, and there's also thigh piece. This is just showing the the uh, calf piece. But what it does is it stimulates the nerve that helps pick up the toes. So this person has pretty severe foot drop, um, which can be a side effect of brain injury, depending on uh, how it affects you physically. Um, so what it does is as it takes a step, it has. Um, uh, I'm not going to try to even pretend to know that how this technology works, but there's some kind of gyroscope in it that can feel when the foot is taking a step and can kick that toe up um, to, so that that foot can clear um, so that the gait patterns um, that people develop to compensate those uh, the circumductions and the hip hiking, um, it helps to uh, alleviate some of those by helping clear the toes. Um, and it, it takes a little practice sometimes it will turn the foot out and we, we have to work to get the toes to come straight up. Um, Is that through some kind of electronic stimulation to the leg, to the calf? Mm -hmm. Yep, right okay. on right on the nerve uh, in the front of that leg. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, so. there's another piece you can't see or you can see if you look for it on his leg up tucked underneath his shorts, you can see it poking out right there. Um, and those pieces are talking to each other uh, throughout this process. Yep, they are sequenced to um, work with a, a gait cycle. Um, like I said, they kind of go by the person's own stride. Um, so it's not on like a timer or anything. It's just, it, it 
it knows when that person is pushing off. So the bottom cuff is picking up the toes and the top cuff is helping um, the hamstring pull the leg up behind and bend the knee a little bit more. Um, so that, that bringing the toes up helps with that circumduction so that they don't have to swing their leg around to get those toes off the ground. And then that top one, bending the knee a little bit more helps with the hip hiking. So they don't have to pull their hip up to the side. Um, to try to get that leg through. So it's it's kind of a, a one-two punch there. So that kind of detail is an interesting example. Um, do you have to get people thinking about those pieces to move it or how do you, um, is it different with each client or is it automatic? It's automatic. So there's um, there's pads on like the inside of the, um, like electrodes on the inside of the device mm -hmm. um, that go against that nerve and stimulate it in a pattern. Oh, okay. And that okay. pattern is, determined by the person's step. And like I said, I, I couldn't begin to tell you how that technology works. Um, but, uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter to think about technology, just the um, that's an example of a level of capacity that's needing to be restored because of the nervous system part damage. You know, like all the other people here that had brain injuries, like mm -hmm. we don't have that physical symptom. So then it's kind of hard to relate to it, but if it, if you get it going and then it starts going on its own, that's a nice feature. That would yeah, be, so yeah. you don't have to worry about, like, you would just walk as you normally would if you mm -hmm. were wearing this device. If you had some kind of foot job or needed a little bit of help with a certain um, muscle that this device helps, you would just put it on and try to walk as normal. And then we as the therapist would make the adjustments to try to do what we wanted to do. So it's not um, it's not something again that I would worry about using with somebody with cognitive impairments. Um, aside from that, again, as, as long as they can let us know if the stem's too high and it's painful um, or if it's like stretching the foot too much, um, then we, we would want them to be able to convey that to us. But that's really the, the biggest um, uh, Thing that we would worry about. I that, think one of the one of the analogies I use with our clients that I th uh, uh, that I think is helpful as a lay person myself is you know for some of our clients uh, you know there's uh, uh, the, there's the freeway between the brain and the muscle and for some of our clients that freeway is broken and so when the message tries to travel the freeway it can't. Um, for some of our clients, there are some side streets that are still open. And so repetition and exercise therapy can help teach that message to go on the side streets. For some of our clients, it's, um, it's not that the freeway is broken. It's that the, the, the sending of the message in the brain is like, is where the cognitive is where there's a cognitive challenge. And so the message in the brain can't get on the freeway to begin with. Um, so in these scenarios, what's happening is basically a fake message is arriving to the muscle. And there are, there are theories there in place that by having this fake message continually arriving to the muscle, that cognitive association can start to develop again. So that's kind of, I think that might be more relevant to, to um, TBI specific on um, where some of the intention is behind it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, Dan, yeah. the guy that I'm thinking, as I'm listening to these guys, these guys talk, I, yeah. I keep thinking about David Sukart. The the guy who died, right? Yeah, the guy who fell. Yeah, I know. So I had this yeah. discussion with him, and he explained this from his rebuilding his walking perspective. And he and I were on the same page because I had the same things with the cognitive rebuild, but it was um yeah, like when you said at the end, does that make sense? that's how everyone talks about it so it doesn't make sense because you also that was the only person i ever talked to about it and he was explaining it with restoring his body his ability to move his feet and basically regain walking but from like a really low nothing was there he couldn't initiate it um yeah so that makes a lot of sense uh the, so, yeah, okay. the freeway analogy makes a lot more sense if you're going through the experience <clears throat> and then it's like okay that's good that's a good way to get on board with this kind of work just as a point of reference so you know this fellow had a stroke was in a wheelchair for years and had a feeding tube yeah. implanted in his chest and um i met him in his last year of life at the tai chi studio <clears throat> and before he died uh he was out of the wheelchair wow 
That's crazy. Yeah, wow is right. It was unbelievable. And yeah, he regained it through Tai Chi. He had this whole story. We, yeah. I think I got a recording of Randy and I talking about his story, but that's a whole other um, story to get into another time. Yeah. We'll continue on with some equipment, and then we're, uh, yes. after that we've got Chris, because <laughs> uh, Chris is Chris has a great perspective as well. So let's, uh, Kristen, you want to talk about uh, the Galileo? Sure. Yeah. This is our um, our vibration therapy. <laughs> um, so this um, woman in this video is doing um, exercises, stepping onto and off of it. Um, if you were to just stand on it, basically it's a plate that vibrates up and down, and the frequency can be pretty slow or it can go pretty fast, and the idea is that it contracts and relaxes the muscle over and over again. Um, so it's very ideal for people who um, have um, spasms or tone um, or any of those kind of effects um, from their injury, um, which we see in a lot of our clients, um, especially that, that hypertonicity. Um, to do exercises on it, it can help um, if that tone goes rigid when people try to move um, doing different movements like lunges or split squats, um, as uh, she was doing in the first, like some step ups um, and trying to make smoother movements. Um, it can help kind of relax those muscles and let her focus on just individual um, movements. Like she's just trying to bend her knee and lift her foot up on onto the plate. Her body wants to do a whole lot of other things. <laughs> um, so that shaking that vibration um, can let the other muscles relax and let the ones that she wants to work on do what they want to do. And then here, this is um, another form of that electrical stimulation um, that the Bioness had a, a couple slides ago. Um, so these are um, bikes, cycles, and they can do lower body or upper body. Um, so it can be an arm cycle like this or the lower cycle that you see here. And same thing, there are electrodes that attach to different muscles to help patterning so that they can perform the cycling movement. Um, so again, even if they have no function below their level of injury, um, or you know, for like for some people with um, brain injuries, it might affect one side. It might affect um, a, a lower leg more than something else. There are different ways that these injuries present. Um, or again, just that tone and spasms. A lot of people can have those super tight muscles or super spastic muscles. Um, so this can help kind of pattern and create that smoother movement by contracting and relaxing the muscles in that pattern um, to create the cycling motion. Um, same thing with the, the upper body. Um, if um, they can either do the arms and forearms, if, uh, if the hands are affected, we can put um, electrodes on the hands and have them opening and closing. We just have to um, attach their arms to the bike in a different way and they can work on their fingers and hands while they're cycling too. There's another question. What, um... How do you fine tune the finding of where their problems are? How much of it is listening to what the person is going through? So when people first come to Pushing Boundaries, the first thing that we do um, on their first session is do a full evaluation of them. Um, and the first part of that evaluation is uh, we have a series of questions that they ask. What is their sensation? What do um, they feel like they can do for movements right now? Um, do they have hot and cold sensation? Do they have touch sensation, light touch, uh, hard touch? Um, that kind of stuff. So they can let us know there. We run them through some muscle movement tests. Um, and then generally people will come in and say, um, you know, I'm standing again, but I'm having a hard time um, uh, taking steps with my right foot, or I'm having a hard time initiating, uh, picking up my knee. People know their injuries. They, they know what they need work on. Um, and we might see something different that maybe they haven't picked up on, like, oh, maybe the reason that they can't get that leg through isn't the knee bending, but it's that, that foot drop or vice versa. Um, so we can, we can add to it and give our opinions, but it's really um, the clients coming in and saying, I need to work on this. I have this issue. This muscle's not working the way I want it to. What can we do to fix this? Um, and then we build the program from there. Again, uh, layperson language here chiming in. I always describe it when I when I describe it to to, to donors and supporters as um, <clears throat> uh, our clients come in for a personal training session. Their personal trainer just happens to have a bachelor's or master's degree, and they work on some really cool equipment. So there's just this deeper knowledge, and they have additional training. Then again, as well, working with neurological conditions um, and this this understanding. So you know, it's like we work 
in conjunction with the medical community, but we really aren't a part of the medical community in that same way. Our, our, our clients feel very empowered when they come in because they're in charge and, and we're here to help them. Does insurance cover your services for the most part? Nope, nope, not at all. So how are people paying for, how are they funding this rehab? I'll table that till we get further along. I'll tell you the quick answer is they're paying for it and we fundraise to keep those rates as reasonable as possible. Like that is the, that mm -hmm. is the quick, the quick answer I'll give you. Um, uh, and we can talk more about it as we, uh, when we get to that point, but uh, it, uh, Exercise therapy is not recognized as healthcare in Washington State, so we can't even we can't even bill to an insurance company. It's not that 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 like we we don't even have the provider numbers to do that. So um, uh, your your services are not within the, the insurance nomenclature code. Exactly, exactly. This is why nothing gets fixed. Um, don't even get me started, man. Let's, yeah, that's let's, why we're here. Yeah, that's why we're yeah, Dan here. will tell you, don't get me started. Go ahead. I, I can believe it. I can believe it. Uh, Kristen, you want to just talk yeah. briefly about the Amadeo and then we'll get to Chris's interview? May I um, add one question that's in the chat? Um, yeah. uh, a comment is confused why you would use this type of arm movement in the sitting position. The diaphragm may be challenged, especially with extra body weight. Raising the arms in this way then constricts the auxiliary muscles in the shoulders and neck that are needed in expanding the lungs upward for compensation. I don't know about my timing of this question, but. I'm assuming they're referring to the video of the, um, the cycle. Um, so depending on this person's um, level of injury, um, we don't have to worry about if it's a low level of injury, we don't have to worry about the diaphragm too much. Um, this person might have a higher level of injury because I think they had um, gloves on their hands help, helping hold the dumbbells together. Um, we like to combine a lot of exercises to work on different things. Um, and diaphragmatic training um, is, is part of it. We don't specifically train breathing. That's kind of out of our wheelhouse. Um, but we would never do anything that would make anybody uncomfortable or in pain. Um, but we do like to challenge people in different ways. Um, and one of the biggest complaints I would say we get with um, different injuries um, and people who uh, have lower functioning due to paralysis or movement disorders uh, is that they have a really hard time getting cardio. Um, so a good way to do that is to combine these upper body movements with um, the more passive cycling movement. Um, so if he has no uh, movement below his level of injury. That bike is doing all those autonomic functions. It's it's helping with all of that that blood flow and movement of those muscles and stretching them out. Um, but he's not getting a good cardio workout. So we got to add in some other stuff to um, make his time as full as possible and get as much out of that workout as he can. Is your is the therapies that you design? Um, I'm trying to think of how to put this. I'm wondering how long people spend doing this, but I guess it depends on the nature of the injury and what their issues are. Every client is completely different. Yeah, I mean, yeah. especially given our broad spectrum of, of clientele yeah. that we see, you know, I would say brain injury is about 20% of our current clientele um, uh, uh, that are categorized as TBI. I think right now we're at about 30% of our clients are navigating stroke recovery and our biggest is still spinal cord injury just because that community is so, I don't know about where you all live, but here in, in, in the Pacific Northwest, it's, it's an incredibly strong and cohesive community. And so um, uh, about 40% of our clients w fall into the spinal cord injury. Now, and some of those folks, um, you know, they have a, a co-diagnosis, right? Like they have a spinal cord injury as well as a TBI or, uh, you know, the, the, depending on the circumstances of, of their situation. So. Um, but all of our clients are so unique. Some, some of our clients, quote unquote, graduate. You know, uh, we have clients. We have a client who uh, I'm thinking of, uh, Larry KK, who uh, who rolled in and and 11 months later walked out. And um, and some of our clients are high level spinal cord injury clients, and they come here for the autonomic purpose, for the the help, and quite frankly, for the camaraderie for mm -hmm. the, the, the benefits of just feeling like they're moving. Um, and so every client is really, really different. Um, I think I'll move us on to Chris. 
and because he can talk about his experience as a client navigating TBI. Um, uh, just on the on the video here, real quick, is our robotic hand uh, uh, tool. KK, you want to just briefly? Sure. Yeah. So this is our. Um, it's a mag magnetic system um, and does work like a robot. So you can see the the fingers are. Um, there are magnets bandaged onto the fingers and then they go on those finger pieces. And then uh, this can be a passive exercise if people have a lot of tone in the hands, just to kind of slowly stretch that hand out and get them some movement there. Or if they have some movement and they wanna strengthen those fine motor skills, there's games that they can play um, to work on opening and closing that hand over and over again, trying to um, ease that tone and get that function back and stronger. Um, pretty Perfect. Cool nice. <laughs> All right. We're going to let y'all hear from Chris, who's one of our clients who uh, has had a TBI in 2016, I think. Uh, uh, and we kind of adore Chris. And so he kindly sat in our office a couple weeks ago just so that we would have something to integrate here. I think what's what's interesting here is um, what, as he's talking, I threw in a couple of, of pieces of footage of him working out. And Chris, uh, like Chris is in better shape than I am, quite frankly, and uh, and uh, is a really healthy guy, and a lot of his stuff really translates into balance, and 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 um, the team uses very traditional exercise. Uh, tools with him. He doesn't use a lot of this extra special equipment. He, he his is really based on traditional exercise, but with that knowledge of the cognitive piece. So we'll let him speak for himself here. What was your injury? What was the circumstances around your brain injury? Uh, so 2016, I was in a car accident. I was rear-ended at not at like freeway speeds. I was stopped in traffic. I was hit at 60 miles an hour by a van. Yeah, so I was taking a harbor view, and I mean, I showed up there with lots of things broken. I know for the brain injury piece, there was some pretty significant bleeding in the brain, and they like drilled a hole in my brain that let they like not build up pressure and not make the injury worse. Okay, the ultimate brain injury diagnosis was a diffuse axonal injury, which you might be familiar with, maybe not, but essentially it, there's no precise point in the brain was injured. It was just kind of everything was shooken a little bit too hard and I'm sure medical people know a lot more about it than I do, but that was the diagnosis and the manifestation of it <clears throat> primarily for me is <clears throat> balance, cognition and short-term memory, which I'm currently struggling with to remember what the question was. Yeah. Injury happened in 2016. Before that, I was working as an attorney and, well, so I graduated law school in 2013. I want to say I did law school part-time at night, I was working full-time during the day. That was fun, but I finally finished that 2013. So I was working as an attorney up until the accident. Yeah. Did that for a short time after, but that was not very conducive to the injury and living. So I've stopped doing that. But yeah, also before that, me and my wife bought a piece of property on Soquami and we're like rehabbing it for horse things, which it is now and it's doing that. But yeah, that was kind of before. For me and my brain injury, obviously there are like neurological issues as well. And then there's brain injury issues. They are not the same, but manifest, depending on how they manifest. I mean, for me, the traumatic brain injury, one of the big things for me was balance. I'm not sure if 
you remember when I first came here, like, like these guys love having me do like a heel to toe walking, and I could not do it. Now I can. Yeah. And, like that's come a long way. Yeah, you know, and even back then I could still walk in here under my own power, and mm-hmm. that was good enough. I didn't have like a walker or anything, but my balance has gotten so much better in the past few years. So that's, I mean, that helps a ton. <clears throat> I mean, so the physical recovery from the brain injury in doing exercise, like practicing, and whether it's like the brain remembering things that it used to do or figuring out new ways to do them, I don't know. But I know like the balance was a big one, and that was like that's entirely brain injury. There were no neurological impacts there, and I don't know what the cause cause to recover on that one. But I feel like doing exercise, doing things helps. I would like to think exercising and doing those things helps the cognitive piece. I would like to think. I don't know what the science is on that one, but if nothing else, I don't know, for me personally, being active, doing things just helps. I mean, certainly helps my body recover and all of my imbalances, helping me keep them more in balance than they would be otherwise. Because if I didn't, everything would be real bad. Mm-hmm. But in working on them, it helps them get better. And yeah, I know for me, exercising helps with you know, functioning, cognition, just everything. Yep. Like it's exercise, it helps. And for me personally, it was a big thing. And this was before the brain injury. Like I've always gone to a gym. I was never like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. But I mean, I was bad at it, but like, since I was in high school, I've always gone to the gym. I've always worked out a couple times a week. That's something that I did before. So getting back to that for me is important. And we were talking, I think the brain injury balance piece, there isn't another way to rehab that. Like they they have tried medically everything they can do to, we've done the upwind maneuver. We've diagnose everything we can but there isn't any other therapy for it other than exercise yep that's all you can do i mean there are two problems for me one the balance there is a safety concern mine isn't necessarily you know it's not the biggest concern in the world but it's harder to push yourself without someone there. These guys have way more exercises that I can say like, hey, you know, I I want to work on this. I How do I, what kind of exercises can I do to help this? And these guys can help point me in the right direction. That was a little bit from Chris. We, we kind of adore Chris. He's got an adorable child as well. Um, KK, you want to? pick up with the challenges around brain injury specifically? Sure. I mean, you guys know this better than better than we do, but um, <laughs> you know, no two brain injuries are the same. Um, so we take that into account. Um, and as I said, when we do our evaluations, um, clients are a big driver in, in how we go about programming. Um, but some of the common challenges that we do see, um, partial or total paralysis of certain muscles, um, muscle atrophy um, of affected muscles, and movement impairments, loss of balance and coordination, like Chris was talking about, uh, hypertonicity and spasticity, um, muscles moving when they're not supposed to or um, too much, um, ataxia, um, and aphasia and communication challenges. Um, those, are, those are the big ones that we, we see kind of stringing through uh, a lot of our clients that live with brain injuries. Um, so the goals of our program. The balance stuff, is it vestibular more or is it more a um, cognitive regulation of balance? Vestibular, um, yeah. definitely. And, and it can also be musculature too. Um, but oh, like okay. for somebody like Chris, it was, it's definitely vestibular. Um, and again, that, that repetition is really um, all we can do. It's never going to, um, 
we're not going to try to pretend that exercise is going to to fully fix a vestibular uh, issue with a brain injury like that. Um, but doing it over and over again, those other pathways, muscles can get stronger um, and, and you can regain balance in different ways um, yeah. to, help, to help with those situations. And what about the um, the tremoring? The What was the term you used? What do you think is the underlying that? Or is it hard to say? Um, spasticity is, is usually um, kind of comes along with with paralysis or partial paralysis. Um, it's those signals getting getting mixed up. Um, uh, the Michael's I I five analogy. Um, it's those it's those backroads that the GPS is trying to figure out which one to send you down, um, and it's it's going all over the place and um, maybe sending you down some roads you shouldn't uh, and uh, some some roads too fast. So back to the goals. Um, increase that strength and function because um, that just helps with everything um, independence wise it helps with all the activities of daily living um, standing walking going upstairs um, doing dishes um, as Chris says even just kind of like focusing in on stuff it can help with that that cognition and um, giving you a focus while you're doing something improving balance and coordination improving mobility improving that gait pattern fluidity um, speed um, another big thing we hear a lot um, is not necessarily um, that, that gait pattern needs to be fixed, but just comfort and being out in crowds. Um, if you have those balance and coordination issues, um, crowds, uh, bad sidewalks, um, we all know how good the sidewalks of Seattle can be. Um, and I don't know where <laughs> the rest of you are coming from, but I'm from Boston and the sidewalks are even worse there. So um, just What's making- What's wrong with people... the sidewalks in Seattle? What's that? What's wrong with the sidewalks in Seattle? Oh, dude, they're horrible. They mm -hmm. are horrible. Our city, uh, yeah. What's yeah. wrong with the sidewalk? Um, uh, there's a, a lot of unmanaged tree root growth and a lot of unrepaired uh, 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 damage to sidewalks. They're they're kind of uh, uh, a, a hazard. They're especially for anybody with any kind of uh, physical uh, physical impairment yeah. and or and or perfectly healthy people who are on their phones too much and just not paying attention to where they're putting their feet. Um, you know, uh, they are, uh, uh, I, I could send you pictures, it's just of my neighborhood. The hills in this one city are the Kristen, Kristen, one of the things I'm kind of curious about hmm? with everything that you've talked about here in exercise and its impact on cognition and or the physical manifestations of it, but what about the emotional impact of the trauma itself? Yeah. Um, Can you speak to that at all or? Yeah, I mean, we, so <laughs> there's two sides to this. Like, obviously we're not trying to provide any sort of like, uh, or, you know, or, mental therapeutic. <laughs> it's yeah, a little yeah, bit out yeah, of our yeah, scope, yeah, yeah. but I will say um, part of what people love about coming here uh, is, is the community. And there is a huge benefit to one, being in a gym and feeling like you can do things, um, if you have a hard time doing that in a traditional gym, is really big. Um, being like feeling more independent here, um, not feeling like the center of attention in a bad way. Um, obviously, we're, you know, as trainers, we are focused on you, um, but you're not standing out because of any kind of um, physical presentation of your injury or cognitive presentation of your injury. Right. Right. You're in good company here. Um, and then, clients talking to each other about different things that they're going through. Um, they'll talk to each other about what they do traveling, what they do, um, you know, navigating the, the streets of Seattle here, um, how they go to different events in different places that aren't accessible um, or like tips to make things more accessible, how to ride the bus, um, different things like that. People who are newly injured will, will talk to people who have had their injuries for a while and, um, you know, become it becomes a real community here. I'd like to dovetail on that, if I could, Kristen, um, in terms of what you were talking about, making it a, a place where people can experience mastery. Um, one of the questions in the uh, chat, well, comments in the chat, and I would pose it as a question for what I'm about to read, is this the kind of thing that you can help in your setting? The comment is, for me, I knew my brain would take longer to recover, so I thought at least I could get my body back in shape. 
I was in dance and a majorette. I could dance easier than walk. Foot drop with fatigue. The sense of mastery is needed for emotional resilience in me. I'm dizzy when bicycling, but after a while, it is no longer. I'm dizzy and off balance every time I start something new physically. Heart rate, breathing, and cognitive processing is my trigger to dizziness and balance, if I said that right. Yeah. Um, sorry, does somebody say something? Well, is that the kind of thing that um, is in the realm of what you help people with? Yeah, um, and that, that dizziness is a, um, a another challenge that we face. We have a, a client currently um, with a brain injury who that's probably her main um, complaint. She can she can walk. She uses a walker, but it's really just for comfort, that comfort of walking around, taking the things like that, um, having her be um, have a level of comfort. Um, and she um, has expressed how much it helps coming here and um, feeling like she can do things and feeling like she's safe. Um, cause a, a lot of people can do, I mean, Chris was a perfect example. He's, he is not an out of shape guy and he wasn't when he started here. Um, but there is a component of, um, I mean, he could probably pretty easily go to any standard gym now, but he, he has, you know, told me offhand was part of the interview, but, um, he, he likes the comfort of that. We have the knowledge of his injury, um, and, know the side effects and other like complications from it. So there's that factor and he feels safe here. Um, he feels like we would know what to do if he did get dizzy or if he did um, get off balance and um, that we would protect him. And um, that gives him a level of confidence here and other clients a level of confidence here um, that you just might not get in another setting. Mm -hmm. And a follow up to the dizziness question because I did hear you say, oh, that's a hard one. Um, and I personally experienced dizziness myself. And I, uh, what I was working with a physical therapist on, and I can't remember the net words because it was something like some of the things you need to learn that you just can't do. Some of the things we can work on so that you can. What are those words anyway? Um, it seems not like iterations of that. I don't know what the exact. Okay, is. it's like they both started with an R and sounded similar, but were different. <laughs> but yeah, but you help people figure out what they have to work around and what people can get better at as different. And I think tasks. to Kristen's to Kristen's point, uh, and to yours, Nancy, is um, you know that working in alongside the medical community but not a part of the medical community like because insurance won't pay for it you don't need a referral to come here but we do require your doctor to 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 give us a medical clearance and to tell us what's happening with you so that we're walking in mm -hmm. knowing how to keep you as safe as possible because for yeah. some of our clients there mm -hmm. are very specific things that that are needed to keep them safe um, some of our clients uh, particularly our clients who are not navigating brain injury, but navigating spinal cord injury and have been in a, in a, um, in a wheelchair for 10 years and haven't been upright much, may not have the bone density to be able to use the robotic pants because their bones are too brittle at this point. So wow. those are the types of things that, that, that we also engage with. Um, and for some of our clients, we are, um, a part of their medical team in that their their PT or their doctor we're in regular communication with because the client has asked us to do that. Other clients are like, please know uh, they are so like over the medical world that this is where they come and feel really empowered. And so, you know, that's all the client's discretion. Like they have that ownership in, in, in a unique way. The only thing that we go into is around safety. Like it's really important for us to keep our clients safe. Um, and we have clients with um, dizziness issues. We have clients with seizure issues. We have clients um, with aphasia issues that we have to figure out communication styles with. Like every client, it's one of our challenges is we can't, we're hard to report on because every single client is so unique and different that trying to find that common red thread to write a nice qualitative report of, of, of impact is really difficult sometimes. I think you need to be a neuroscientist and also yeah. have a brain injury and then also deal with that every day. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, yeah that's sure. exactly why I, I, I appreciate this discussion a lot. And thanks for giving the, those answers to the questions. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question and then to, to kind of keep it going, but um, there's gotta be some groupings. There's gotta be some distribution between the spinal stuff versus TBI and brain and stroke. There, or, or is it really just so mixed that you can't really group it by that? I'm not sure if I follow your question, Dan. Oh, sorry. How different are, like if you were to say most people with this kind of injury have very specific characteristics, characteristic symptoms, um, or is it really not groupable by, let's say, brain injury versus spinal cord injury? Common denominators to each group, so to speak? Yeah, and certain characteristics and certain features and certain um, okay. nature there's of the problems and what they there's describe. There's definitely characteristics that string it all together. It's why yeah. this facility and others like it have expanded beyond spinal cord injury because there is overlap between what happens with a spinal cord injury, what happens with a brain injury, what happens with a stroke. All of the, the neurological physical side effects um, are not the same, but they're similar. So paralysis can happen with all of these things. Tone and spasms can happen with all of these things. It's autonomic right. uh, yeah. functions like being uh, affected can happen with all of these things. There's differences like stroke tends to be one side um, and tends to have a very specific pattern then it goes in, but not always. Um, spinal cord injury, tend, it, it goes by level and, and where they're hit, um, but there's a bunch of different presentations. It can be complete complete it can include upper body not include upper body it, um, right, right, right. you know people will get full recovery back some people will never recover um much at all um and brain brain injury is just probably the most dramatically uh, has the most dramatic spectrum um <laughs> of ways it, it can present because there are cognitive issues there are speech issues there are mm -hmm. um there can be movement issues um and sometimes the movement issues and, and again this comes back to um us having that extra level of knowledge that maybe um, somebody who's a personal trainer or um, it, you know does not work with this population often wouldn't know. Um, but two two dizzy clients, one it could be like Chris and be a little more bit vestibular and something we work on in one way, and then somebody else could be dizzy because um, they haven't stood in a year and their blood pressure gets low every time they stand, and that is something that we work on in a very different way, and that we can actually help correct over time. So, Kristen, a lot of the stuff that you just mentioned, for example, the various issues and problems that people have, I mean, that's, those same issues could be present in the context of somebody who needs physical therapy who hasn't had a stroke or a brain injury or whatever. Am I correct about that? So what I'm wondering is, how come you guys aren't considered just an, an extension, or if that's the way of putting it, of physical therapy? I'm going to I'm going to chime in with this one Ren, and just say that is a, a such a long answer that it would take us another 6 hours to talk about um you know uh exercise exercise therapy is different from physical therapy based on on kind of scope um and there are there are a lot of movements out there to to integrate exercise therapy into the traditional healthcare model um I'll, I'll briefly kind of talk offline just a little bit of my experience. So I'm, um, uh, by trade, I'm a medical massage therapist. And Washington State led the country in having massage therapy recognized as a form of health care back in the 90s. And it took uh, about 10 years of, of lobbying uh, by the massage therapists to get the state to recognize it. And since then, other states have followed suit. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, exercise therapy is such a small um, niche, as it were, right now. It 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 is really a form of treatment that's in its infancy still, and so um, so it just doesn't have that uh, that um, yeah. legislative push to to navigate through all of that at this point. So um, or yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and 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 the backing, right, and. Um, you are starting to see uh, 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 research coming out about exercise and specific exercise. Um, again, uh, I'll, I, mean, I have a slide I'm going to share with you all in a little uh, near the end here just for some resources. But uh, we, we really have um, Christopher Reeve and the spinal cord, uh, really Christopher Reeve Foundation kind of brought so much of spinal cord to the general population. 
uh, right. you know, 20, 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, um, and even if y'all are interested, I know that we've got different parts of the country. Um, SpinalCord.com has a great web, has a great web page of, of like, of functional therapy centers around the United States and many of whom deal with TBI as well. But like, that's where the majority of organization still has happened at this point. But um, I, we go back and forth uh, around uh, uh, spinal cord. Here, let me, I'll, I'll just yeah, let's up do the thing. Slide. Yeah. Let me do the slide real quick. Uh, first of all, if anybody is local, please come for a tour. There's, there's no cost to that. We would love to show you around um, and and uh, and come visit us. Um, but uh, uh, I do want to say, so um, part of my job is fundraising. Right now, um, I have, we have um, a scholarship program specific to TBI. So um, we have three $1,000 scholarships and it is a very simple application process, and we would love for that money to get used. If any of you are local and have financial need, by all means, please feel free to contact us, uh, uh, and because uh, that's part of what we're trying to do is is really make this as accessible as possible. Um, and part of our resource page has other scholarship opportunities out there that are not specific to pushing boundaries. So. Um, there, there are there are scholarship opportunities out there for injured previous athletes who want to u- who want money to continue training as an athlete, that could be used towards pushing boundaries or could be used towards someplace local. So, this map is on spinalcord.com, spinalcord.com, right there for you, uh, and some of these places are physical therapy. Some of them are exercise therapy. Some of them are occupational therapy. But what they all have in common, in theory, is an ability to navigate people um, uh, uh, navigating neurological challenges as a part of their movement challenges with a really practical, functional level. You know, um, like our clients don't come in and say, I want to be able to lift my arm four times in a row to a 45 degree angle, right? Like, like, like our clients come in and say, I want to be able to balance and lean myself against the sink and help my wife do dishes. Like, and so that's where our goals start is at a really function and activity based. Um, and, and so I, uh, there are systems out there. There's only about 20 that are really similar to us. These other ones do incorporate things like physical therapy. One of the challenges we run into with physical therapy uh, is, um, you know, you get 20, you get 20 or 12 sessions in a year. Well, some of our clients come twice a week, and so that's your, that's your. If it was billable to insurance, that's your insurances for the year used up in six weeks. Um, as somebody who used to run a, a clinic, um, one thing insurance companies, particularly with physical rehab, are moving more and more towards is uh, what's called third-party authorizations. So they will only, even if your insurance policy says you get 50 PT visits a year, after the first four, if you can't say you're improving at the rate that they've determined you're improving, then they just stop covering them. And so we we kind of go through this back and forth. I, I, don't get me started about how broken the U.S. medical system is, but we go through this back and forth of like we kind of like being outside of it too. Uh, I would rather uh, if I could get if we're across the street from Microsoft headquarters. If I could get Microsoft headquarters to give us a million dollars a year, it would pay for every single one of our clients to come here for free at our current client levels easily. Yeah, but Microsoft isn't going to do that, right? No. I will say, I do want to say... Bill Gates. I I, I do want to say, uh, I use Microsoft, uh, but I also want to just caveat that with, they are very generous. Microsoft, more than any of our other big tech companies in town, anytime a Microsoft employee donates to us, Microsoft matches it 100%. So I do feel the need to just clarify and say that, that they are mm-hmm. good in some ways. So Well, I would just say they're consistent with all the other things that aren't interested in non, non-brain injured people that aren't interested in brain injury because yeah. they don't think about it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, um, 
I think there's a lot of the levels of what is missing that we can definitely have a discussion about that sometime. Were there any other slides just to go through all the rest of that? We were almost at the end, so yeah, I let's just finish it. yeah. Okay, um, and I also nice. want to I would I want to take a moment because um, we do have a, a a therapist who's out sick, so Kristen has to take a client, so we've got her for about five more minutes. I can hang yeah. out forever. So if anybody has any specific Kristen questions, I want to just. Uh, to give that opportunity now before we have to let her go at 1215. Christian, are you an exercise physiologist or what is your background exactly? So my background is in exercise science. Um, I'm actually from Massachusetts, if anybody's local to there. Went to Salem. That's okay, I'm from Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I got my um, undergrad uh, in exercise science. It was actually called sport and movement science. It's called something a little different everywhere. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and I worked as a personal trainer uh, for about 10 years. Um, and then all the, the neurological side of this job, we learned on the job here. We had, it's a big training curve, big learning curve here. Um, yeah. It takes about six months to fully train uh, a new therapist. Same here, here, I learned it on the job, but mm -hmm. you know, yeah, we all do. Okay, I was just curious. Chris, and then she went and got her master's degree as well. So then we had to gank her into management too. So, <laughs> what would you recommend for anyone that's thinking about this kind of therapy? But I don't know, like sometimes just getting in helps. Or what would you recommend for people thinking about it or recognizing that they have that kind of problem? Um, as as far as just trying to um, look like looking for resources, um, I that's finalcord.com and finding a place and just going and see it if they have a free tour they have like a way to go and see it for free just check it out um i think everything's worth worth trying once um and seeing if it's right for you um and what if there isn't a place near you well that's unfortunately that could, that could be uh <laughs> that like could everybody be else you basically <laughs> <end up> being <laughs> screwed yeah, yeah that could be a very honest. real uh situation um i I think the biggest thing is to try to find doctors who really understand neurological conditions. And that sounds really uh, yeah. obvious, but it's, it does not always seem to be the case here. Um, not all doctors understand. Um, I remember when I first started here, um, we have, uh, it's, it's not really an issue with brain injuries, but there's something that happens with spinal cord injuries called autonomic dysreflexia. It's basically a spike. I never had to do it, but apparently there was a, a situation right before I started where um, uh, paramedics came um, for somebody who was having this episode and the therapist had to explain to them what was happening and what to do about it because they had no idea what it was, um, which is just shocking to me. Um, there's just so much about neurological disorders uh, that just the general medical population just doesn't have that much experience with. So find practitioners that understand the neurological side of things is probably the biggest uh, I'll <laughs> we've my we've, experience good luck <laughs> when it comes to exercise we've experimented and done some beta testing of home programs and whether or not there's room to like have something where people can have remote access to things um, we haven't found the right um the right kind of combination yet that that navigates both um enough oversight to make sure that we're, we can recommend things that are safe for individuals without us being there. Um, and, uh, and I'll be honest, bandwidth, we're very, we have, we have seven employees total. So we're a, we're a small organization uh, and, uh, and uh, navigating uh, we've, when we've done these beta tests, what we've found is um, we've, we've struggled to find enough interest that people would actually um, participate and uh, and pay because there has to be some level of pay. Our staff has to get paid because you know. Um, but I think that that is. I'm really curious to see what happens post pandemic with remote medicine because it, it it's one of those two sided coin things where like there's a real evil side to remote medicine, but there could be real benefits with remote medicine as well. And so what are um, is there some positive that can come out as we learn about these things like Zoom and navigating remotely? Well, I would think doing this remotely is going to be, um, I mean, it might work for a handful of people, but I, I, I would think that that's going to be uh, one hell of a mountain to climb. For I, 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 I agree. I agree. And, I, and especially I for 
for younger people, though, they want it. It's really interesting. It is kind of generational in an interesting way. Telemedicine is largely marketing bullshit, but that's besides the point. Like I said, don't get me started. I've got a lot of background in this. Dan can tell you more. You guys, this is a um, a powder keg, right? <laughs> 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to yeah, say yeah. goodbye to Kristen, and yeah. I'll put the rest yeah. of the slides up, and we'll let Kristen get ready for her client. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Kristen. Thank you, KK. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Kristen. And the I will... Uh, thank you. Re so... Uh, the pieces that that we that Kristen didn't cover that we didn't get to, um, so she left us off with goals, um, which she covered, and then um, she just kind of had a little bit of a, a follow up of our methodology, like kind of our big things as repetition, functional strength training, and then for people who it's appropriate, using electrical stimulation or robotic assistance tools, like kind of those are the four primary tools that our that our therapists use with our clients. Um, you know, the, the, and the repetition pieces is, is rather fascinating to watch, quite frankly. Um, uh, you know, uh, this was our piece. Um, to be a PB client, like I said before, you, for us, and I know for other organizations, um, uh, Project Walk, Push to Walk, those are two of the others that are out there that have multiple locations around the country. Um, uh, but uh, what people need is some, some drive and determination. We need a health history form from the client, a medical clearance from the doctor, and we recommend a sense of humor because we really do try to have fun around here. Um, uh, here's, here's, here's the slide that, about all of the, the healthcare stuff we've been talking about. We're not recognized as healthcare in Washington State, cannot direct bill insurance. Our clients pay for their services. We fundraise to keep those rates available to the many. So, um, so we subsidize every session. And where I can find um, scholarships, I find them. We had uh, I, so this year we've gotten two scholarship funds set up. Um, one is the TBI scholarship specific I mentioned. Um, the other scholarship fund we were able to uh, get was funded by a local uh, uh, native tribe, um, and is uh, is. Um, a uh, scholarship fund specific to Native and Indigenous folks um, uh, with any diagnosis that we um, that we treat, um, but uh, very specifically a lot around TBI because um, the incidence of traumatic brain injury within the Native American and Indigenous populations is 30% higher than it is with the rest of the population of the U.S. Jesus um, Christ! Any idea yep. why that is? Um, there is some tie, the, the studies that I could find did have a tie in regards to um, uh, uh, motor vehicle collisions specifically, that, there, that, there, that there's, there's not enough to fully tie them, but that's the other um, causal piece that can be a causal to, to TBI that, um, that they found a significantly higher um, incidence of. So. Um, uh, again, here's activity-based therapy. Um, if you are in the Pacific Northwest, there is one there is one in Bend that's more physical therapy-based. The one that's most similar to us nearby is um, is in Sacramento, and the Sacramento one is called SCI Fit. So again, starting from a spinal cord injury, but they've they've broadened beyond that. Um, SpinalCord.com. Uh, Michael, did you say the there was one in Oregon and it's in Bend, not Eugene? Because I was looking at that dot trying to place it. I thought that dot looked like Eugene as well. But when we hovered over it yesterday, when I was putting this, uh, uh, grabbing the screenshot, uh, mm -hmm. it was a Bend location. So mm -hmm. I thought that was a very strangely placed star as well. <laughs> The star placement is clearly a problem, but obviously the bigger issue is that these resources don't exist. Yeah. yeah. Michael, let me ask you something. Instead of referring to your organization as exercise therapy, why don't you just refer to yourselves as physical therapists? And I mean, just 
because physical Excuse therapy me. is a fair, physical therapy is a licensed profession. Right. We can't call ourselves physical therapists without being physical therapists. So people have to get doctorates in physical therapy. There's a lot of therapy. doctors who call themselves doctors who aren't doctors. So what else? Well, is that's so not true. They're that. all protected licenses. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and you know that. And what they do is not what it. physical therapists do. Right, exactly. And I think that that's an important fact. What we do is not what physical therapists do. And we've, we've um, technically, you know, if we decided to go that route, we could change our entire structure, hire a bunch of physical therapists, and uh, and our um, our exercise therapists are do have the training and are in scope to to execute physical therapy prescriptions. Right. But that changes the entire entity of what we are, and the part of what we are is something that is client driven, is something where the client has autonomy. And and that is really at the core. And our board of so as a nonprofit, you know, like this isn't my decision to make. We have a board of directors who who, right. who um, but they've had these discussions and they circle back to them every couple of years. Um, and and one of the pieces of feedback that we get, like again, I would rather, um, and believe me, I do. I would rather find. My goal is to find enough funding that we become accessible to everybody versus um, uh, changing who and what we are so that people can bill insurance. Right. Um, like, like, like it, it, it's a different path. And I no, think no, no, that, that would, I mean, that's perfectly understandable, makes sense. Yeah. And speak, speaking of funding, you do have some comments from Moz okay. chiming in about um, ideas and- Okay, let me take um, a look here. Yeah. Which was how could we help um, with legislation and that's and a, uh, an agency a, that might want to be that's approached? That's a great question. I I my I am I am not a legal expert when it comes to to uh, healthcare and healthcare law, but my understanding when it comes to licensure of healthcare roles is that it is still very much a state specific thing. So every state is going to be different, much like. Yeah. The, the parameters to be a physical therapist in Minnesota are different than the parameters to be a physical therapist in Washington state. And the scope is actually different as well. And so I think that that's where it, it really has to be on a state by state level, at least initially. Um, uh, and so I don't know of the resources, but I would welcome any additional conversations beyond this presentation because I think I think it doesn't hurt. And um, Maz, um, actually, I'm going to just put my email in there right now because I welcome anyone to reach out. And uh, hey, Michael, I think that that's where what we were first talking about before the meeting, the Adler, uh, basically having legal influence and in this. I think it has to be built in a way that doesn't exist yet and um, needs to be navigated with their help. So right. there, is, there is a definite like um, levels to be dealt with across the the whole project. So yeah, um, I would um, like to continue this discussion for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, and I'll just, I'll, I'll clue everybody else. And so Dan yeah. and I were talking beforehand, um, we had a fundraiser a few weeks ago and Dan was asking how it went and it went it went as well as can be expected in, in a post-COVID world of the first time everybody getting together and, and doing a fundraiser. It was actually quite good um, and we're pretty lucky. Uh, we're pretty lucky that um, one of our supporters is a, is a local law firm called Adler Giersch and they, uh, they uh, worked with a, a they're big in the brain injury specifically. Uh, several of their uh, uh, several of their uh, partners are on the board of the Brain Injury Association of Washington. One of their partners is on our board, um, and so they are litigators, correct? They are litigators, yeah, um, but but they're about some of the best people I've ever met, honestly. Okay. Uh, uh, and they worked with uh, they worked with Washington State and one of their clients to uh, enact the Lystead Law, which is our our Washington State helmet law for for football players and sports players um, based on the incidence of brain injury. And so they do they do put their money where their mouth is. I will give their their 
they're good in that way. So um, I think that they're a gateway and that there are advocacy gateways out there to help along the way. And we'll see what happens. None of this is fast, unfortunately, and that's the most frustrating part for someone like me who likes to check a box. There, I'm also going to type in our our general website, and then also the specific um, uh, uh, for our resource library, um, because even if you're not local, there are some interesting resources there, uh, and uh, uh, we've worked hard. One of uh, I joined Pushing Boundaries near the end of 2019, uh, and our resource library was a bookcase here in our facility. And uh, one of my first projects was to try to get it online and make it more accessible and keep it updated. And um, we work really hard on it uh, to find resources, and we welcome if anybody has additional resources. I love seeing the face in there. Uh, we welcome uh, we we welcome anybody to send us an email if there's something we should add to it. It really is Kristen and I who just hop on the hop on the website and keep it up to date. So, thank you, Michael. And yeah, sorry, am I? Uh, I guess I'm supposed to be hosting this, but I'm also hosting a four-year-old, so it's hard. Um, but I, I was muting myself most of the time. But anyway, yeah. Um, I think that um, I appreciate the question and answer and the way we've had this discussion, because there's a lot of questions that brain injury people kind of need figured out. And then obviously you guys are working with this population and others and um, the intermingling of what you guys needed to show and also what our questions were, I think was really good. Um, and again, sorry for not being such a good host of this, but uh, no, yeah, this has been I very think informative. Great. I yeah. think it was great. Um, and I really appreciate you all having us. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, I, on a personal note, my dad had a spinal cord injury when I was two and then had a traumatic brain injury when I was 20. He was not a very lucky man. Uh, and so I engaged with this a lot in my youth. Uh, and uh, my dad's uh, TBI recovery was at uh, his initial uh, rehab center recovery was four months. He stayed in a rehab center. Uh, this was a long time ago, but it was on my college campus. So I spent every afternoon with him. And so I, I do have this. It's very easy for me to come to work. And it's very easy for me to work to to try to help um, our clients. And so um, I welcome any and all conversations that can That's help great. the community. That's, and also, um, I had a question, but maybe we can end with this question. I imagine the timeline for any of these kinds of therapies, it ultimately can be just forever um but what kind of programs do you guys have and how does that usually work so it is everything is client by client and we are not you know uh we completely understand uh the financial impact as well so just uh, uh, we are very transparent it costs a hundred dollars an hour to come here and so for a client coming once a week that's four hundred dollars a month for a client coming yeah, if that, does, com that does not strike me as being expensive at all I, I I agree, and we take we take a pride in that, and I thank you for recognizing that. <laughs> but um, we have some clients who come who come twice a week for two hours each time, and so then then yeah. it starts to really yeah. really add up. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, but uh, one of the conversations in that evaluation that that Kristen um, that Kristen talked about is is that very realistic thing, like. If someone can afford to only come here once a month, then is that the best? No, it's hard to build repetition once a month, but it's better than nothing. Come once a month. We'll figure out some way to make it as beneficial as possible for you to come once a month. Like that's part of uh, of of kind of that client centeredness, right? Like like we every client every client's um, progression is different, and every client. Um, uh, some clients plateau and say, hey, I think I'm plateaued, and and they take off. And maybe three years later, we get an email saying, hey, I want to come back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it really, we have one client who actually um, uh, comes from Japan, and she has family here, and she comes uh, twice a year for like two months because she comes and visits her grandchildren twice a year for two months. And she is stroke recovery, um, but 
So we get her on the schedule for the two months that she's here, and then we see her six months later. And like it, it that's kind of the nice thing about being small too, is we, we make it work. We're scrappy that way. Does this law firm that you mentioned have political influence? I don't know that I know the answer to that question. I would probably guess so, but I don't feel like I could speak to it. I've, I've been more focused. Um, I met them when I managed a, a physical rehab clinic and our, my, my clinicians took care of one of their clients um, that they were trying to make sure got taken care of after a, a motor vehicle collision. Let me give um, you the, sh let me give you a real short, whatever. And I'll let Dan fill this in with you later if he wants. Um, a lot of the issues and problems that you talk about in terms of the organization and expansion of the services and getting it out there, I can actually make all that stuff go away. The problem is going to be getting through the political bullshit morass that you've got in every state. That's it in a nutshell. Yeah. And um, I don't know what to tell you. Yep. It's frustrating as hell. Randy, you should send him your book. <laughs> well, it's a little bit dated, but um, but this point is still stands. And it's yeah, not like the political system is gone, but the the problem with healthcare in this country is that the people who make the policy and decisions, legislators, the governor's office, blah blah blah. I can't figure out. I still have no idea what health policy people actually do. Um, is that nobody knows what the hell they're doing. But that's, I know that how that might sound, but that's basically it. I'll let Dan fill you in on more. And I think we could spend the afternoon here with this. So I want to spend more than an afternoon. I could spend a year on it. And <laughs> I'm not inclined to do that again. But um, yeah, I don't know what to do about any of this. I don't dispute anything that you're bringing up or that you've talked, that you or Kristen talked about. Um, problem is, is that there are several sources, but the insurance industry is a big part of it. Uh, for not going to get an argument. But, 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 that, but for reasons that most people do not understand. So in conclusion, yes. I want to add thank you to both Michael and Kristen, even though she can't hear us. And oh, and I guess hello to Isaac behind uh, uh, Daniel. Um, and I was wondering, Daniel, if you could Talk about what's next in terms of um, events. Um, I can talk about it in a second as I get the calendar. Actually, I don't have the calendar. Um, well, hold on one second. Well, I can tell I, you that we don't have anything official until uh, February, right? Yeah, I think that January? February has um, Don Newman's first talk. Yeah, I'm just going to trust my memory. I'm so, going to go. Thank you, Michael. Take care, everybody. I'll be in touch, everybody. Dan, we'll talk again soon. Randy, the woman who's going to talk in February and then again another month later, and um, I need to have the dates if I remember, she's going to talk about the emotional loss with brain injury and then also about the negative attribution bias, which I think are highly interconnected. I would agree um, with you on that. <laughs> and I think it, a capacity of movement injured like the capacity of emotions, is put it bluntly. Um, so she's going to be giving some talks, and then we have the March is Brain Injury Awareness Month. We have a big, or two people, two semin a seminar with two groups talking about building support and the resources for brain injury. So that's highly interesting. Right. We'll February 2nd, I just found it. Don take Newman. care, Michael. Okay, yes. Take care. All right. I'm going to take off as well. Everybody, thank you so much for having us. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Dan will continue our conversations. I appreciate yeah. meeting all of you. Thank you for uh, being and holler if I can answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your help. Take Thank care. You. All right. Bye.